Uh, good afternoon. Oh, it's louder than it was last time. Um, so thanks so much for coming. It's almost completely full, which is fantastic. Um, and almost exactly on time, which is a surprise for me. Um, we've got a great session lined up uh, over the next hour. and um, We're going to be looking at six trends that are going to change the world. Uh, we've it's a bit of an, uh, a different way of doing, uh, doing a uh, session for us with having three speakers kind of presenting to each. Uh, so it's going to be very interesting to see what they've got. They haven't um, talked to each other too much about this before, so we want to make sure that they've all got ones that they really believe in uh, being talked about. So there, there might be a tiny little bit of overlap, but we'll have to see um, and see how it goes. But I know uh, that all three of them have got fantastic presentations lined up, and they're going to talk to you about them. So they're really going to try and sell you these trends, because what we're going to do um, after they're done is we're going to have just a quick 10 minutes of Q&A. And I know there's... Uh, hundreds of people here, so you're probably not all going to be able to ask your questions, but we're going to do a couple of really kind of quick snappy ones if we can. And then we're going to do a vote, um, which is just going to be a show of hands, see which one trend out of the six uh, you guys think is going to have the biggest impact over the next uh, few years. Uh, and, um, and that person will win a, a wonderful prize. Terrible prize. Um, <laughs> and the other two get something as well, which is even worse. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're going to get started. We want to say um, uh, the first speaker we've got is Peter Jordan. And Peter is the founder of uh, Toposophy. Um, he's going to tell you a little bit more about that company because it's, it's really cool. And they're also uh, sponsoring this session today, which is really great to have them on board and to be working uh, with a company like this. So I'm going to hand over to Peter that, and then we're going to go straight through to Ian. Um, who's from Travel Massive. Ian's, uh, I don't know, I think a lot of you here, do, do, who knows Travel Massive? We have hands. Who was there yesterday? Anybody? Any of you got sore heads today? No. no. Um, Ian, Ian's the founder of Travel Massive um, from, um, from Sydney quite a long time ago, and it's also the, basically what got me into travel in the first place as well. So it's really fantastic uh, for us to be, uh, to be working with Ian on this session. And um, lastly, but not leastly, we have uh, Sarah Betty Andrews. Um, I just said this to Sarah before. I, I never know how to introduce Sarah because she's got so many hats and she has so many different um, companies and freelance work and blogs and, and all sorts of stuff. She's absolutely wonderful. So um, she'll uh, explain to you a little bit more about what she does rather than me rambling through it and getting it wrong. So I'm going to hand over to Peter now and uh, yeah, enjoy it all. Good morning, everybody. Um, I've heard that the prize that we're supposed to be getting um, is alcohol, probably cheap alcohol. But um, if there's anything that I need right now, it's actually a double espresso. So um, that, that, that's all I'm interested in by the, by the end of this session. Um, yeah, my name is, is Peter Jordan, and I am the, actually the senior tourism analyst uh, with Toposophy. It's a brand new destination marketing agency. Um, we're going to tell you a little bit more about what we do in a, in a second, um, <clears throat> but I'm going to launch pretty quickly into the trends. Uh, this is the session. Yeah, six new trends that are going to change the, the world uh, of travel in the next few years, and uh, I'm going to be presenting two of them. But first of all, just let you, to uh, let you know a little bit more about myself. I have been working in the World Tourism Organization and several other large uh, travel associations uh, in the past, and that, I think, has given me quite a good eye as to what's going on in travel, tourism and travel in general, and specifically what many of the stakeholders that those people work with are really needing right now. <clears throat> and if there's something that I've identified, it's the theme that I'm going to be presenting shortly. Um, but my, most of my work involves uh, analysis of trends in the travel industry, uh, and in particular how they're being shaped by the younger audience today. Um, and um, a lot of this work that I do is, of course, through Toposophy uh, in bringing workshops together, with, especially with DMOs, destination marketing agencies, and, and many other travel brands. Um, just to tell you a little bit more about who we are, um, first of all, we have a little exercise. Um, we're going to say the name of the company. It's not a cheap marketing exercise. It's because everybody I meet seems to have problems pronouncing it. So the, <laughs> the, the, the name is Toposophy. Brilliant, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, we're actually a business uh, unit of a larger company called Atcom, which is uh, specialized. It's a large uh, media company uh, working mainly in southern Europe, but we're pleased that this month we're going to be opening an office in London. And really, we think that this positions us as consultants to really be able to offer a huge amount of other services in digital media, um, the, exactly the kind of things that tourism boards in the 21st century are going to need. 
And those services are a whole range of services, 360 we call it. Um, all, of the, all of the different services that uh, would someone would be able to outsource to us. Um, we've already been working on uh, projects in four continents already. And uh, I'm really pleased to say that being part of this company, it's a really new company, is, is exciting. And my area is the bit in the middle you can see market intelligence and, and e-business strategy in particular. So that's enough about the company because uh, I'm here, of course, to sell you my trends. And there are two trends, and they are on one hot topic, and that is millennials. Now, of course, I'm sure you all keep up with the travel news. Uh, you read things like Skift, etc. So it doesn't take too long when you're going through some of those uh, news sources to, um, until you come upon this word. And so I'm aware also that, of course, we have a huge amount of millennials here in the audience. So in preparing this, I'm actually quite well aware that I could be preaching to the converted. So when I'm talking about millennials this morning, um, I really would like you to uh, think in a slightly different way. And that millennials are now synonymous with being future ready, with preparing your brand for the future, for preparing your destination for accepting the travelers of the future. And that future really isn't too far away. So, really, why the hell am I going on about millennials when so many people already are? Well, really, um, I see it in these very, three very clear terms. Firstly, is that they are exerting today such a huge influence on the tourism and travel industry, um, mainly through their powers of disruption, as we all know through the sharing economy, but mainly because this is a generation which is not prepared to accept the rules uh, that the older generation grew up with. <clears throat> It's also patently clear that this is the generation that is now driving the growth from the emerging markets. When everybody's talking about this, uh, the current growth that we're seeing and the future growth that is predicted from places like China and India uh, and Latin America, it is the millennial generation that is driving that growth. We have to be clear about that. And this final point is a bit more of an incidental one, but it's true, is that this is the biggest age group now. According to data that was released earlier this year by the European Travel Commission, this is the biggest age group now visiting Europe from the US. <clears throat> so those of you who are from European destinations or, have, or are working with them as influencers, and you're very well aware of how important the US market is to us in Europe and how much uh, American visitors spend, well, uh, it was for the first time released this year by ETC that this is now the largest age group and segment that are visiting. And they're visiting, of course, not just as backpackers anymore. They're visiting as fa with young families and they're visiting as business travelers as well. So my first trend, the way I'm going to put it, is that from now on, the tourism industry is going to have to be millennial proof looking into the future. But you're probably about as confused as Brittany here. Like, what the hell does that mean? What, is, what the hell is, is millennial proof? Well, it's actually pretty simple. It means, as I said, becoming future ready. It means recognizing that millennials are now taking those major decisions in travel. It means respecting the way that they want to plan and, of course, experience uh, travel today. And, of course, it means, uh, as a result, you're going to have to adapt uh, to what you're doing uh, you have to adapt all of your policy and strategy accordingly. Okay, so it means recognizing for a start that, of course, millennials are no longer just passive travelers. They are the people who come to your destination and then they talk about it and they influence people, even if it's not their job, as I know many of, of, uh, of you are who work in, in travel influencing. Um, these are now uh, your customers and this is what they are doing. They're influencing their immediate uh, circle of friends. Uh, you will use social media and you know how important that is. It also means understanding this really important concept. It perhaps looks a bit philosophical, but you know we're so used to day, these days to mixing exactly this, the digital world with the physical world, instantly. Um, of course, working, you don't have to, we know that you don't have to be in the office to be working. Um, you might just be sitting there on Facebook, of course. That's not really what I meant. It means, of course, you can be on the road, and this is a generation that's totally used now to being flexible with their time and working in online, offline, and, and mixing that. Um, and, of course, you know, with the whole world of content, mixing reality with fantasy. Um, and so, you know, you really do have to be in tune with that. Um, this is, so this is the basis, really, of, of, uh, of the trend that I'm presenting to you now. 
It also means moving away from destination, uh, the idea of destination marketing strictly, it also means now modernizing the way we manage destinations, using technology to help people explore more easily. Are you giving millennials the tools that they need to be able to explore by themselves? Because as I said, they're not passive travelers, they want to participate. And um, so this really means giving them the, the technological tools, and there are so many at our disposal already uh, to help people explore their destination. So, as a question, the title of this seminar is, uh, is it going to change the world? Well, mm, you, could, you could argue, say, okay, there, well, this is this all BS, he's talking about millennials. I actually do think it's going to change the world for the travel industry, and here's why. Um, because up to date, up till now, too many of uh, people are still doing things the old way. They're still packaging their products in this old-fashioned way, uh, a kind of off-the-shelf idea of, yeah, we do incoming and we do this and we package it in this way and then we sell it on to... But is this really preparing for the future? I I'm not really convinced that it is. Um, so uh, this means, of course, understanding the millennial mindset. As a company, this is what we do. Um, and you have to, of course, prepare your products and services or, des or a destination in the same way. So, and this is actually the most life-changing aspect of, or the world-changing aspect that I believe is this final point, is if you work with your own millennials, if you work with the millennials around you, in your company, in your destination, those are the people who really will be able to sell it. It's their innovation and their ingenuity that is going to help drive you forward if you bring them together. Okay, so that was the first of my two trends. Now I'm going to bring you the second. And it's still about millennials, as I said, but um, it's actually about recognizing that not all millennials are the same. And this is a very, very easy trap that the travel industry, I think, is falling into. Take a look at this. So, um, actually, I can't work out. Is this the Photoshop version? I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, We'll have, we can talk about that later. Um, but uh, the reason I'm sharing this photo is because it came accompanied with this headline. Apparently, one in three millennials has a tattoo. Well, I guess that depends where you look, doesn't it? Not on the body, of course. But um, uh, I actually, after seeing this headline, I thought to myself, hmm, well, this doesn't really make sense. Is it really that many? Is it really one in three? And then I clicked on a few links, I followed the source, and I went back to where the headline originally came from, and it came from a Huffington Post article, and it was based on some research that had been done by a small sample of 600 Americans living on the West Coast. So, is it, <laughs> surprise, surprise, so is it really one in three millennials around the world has a tattoo? I don't think so. So, what lesson does this teach us? Well, first of all, and this is a, a really hard fact that we have to consider, are millennials, are these people really people like us, PLUs? And I think this, this is a trap that we fall into too often, actually, is the idea that you know, everybody else likes to travel in the same way that we do. Um, you know, let's face it, out, UK outbound, the vast, vast majority, I think are, the masses are still heading for beach destinations together, package holidays and things, which is brilliant. But you know, are we all traveling necessarily in that same way? Do we all have the same tastes, and do we all look for the same experiences when we travel? I don't think so. Um, I think being clear and honest to ourselves about that will help us develop better products. And of course, it's really important when you're reading through the travel media uh, is of always to think to yourself, OK, what's behind the headlines? Whose agenda are we pushing here? But because by uh, separating the nonsense from some of the harder facts and some of the general trends that we're observing about millennials will help you again to develop pr products that actually mean something to somebody. So, and this is my reasoning about how millennials really today are so different. Because as young people, and I'm sure those of you who have children know, of course, young people go through so many different stages. Yes, we're all part of one generation, but young people, of course, are going through so many different uh, things in their life at this stage, which, of course, influence the things that they buy and the way that they travel. And look at these age groups. Every single one of these age groups is going through something different in their life. And, of course, they're looking for different experiences. You can't, uh, of course, uh, equate a young person leaving school at 16 in Manchester who may want to travel with their friends with a young professional of 34 years old in London who's looking to uh, travel around Southeast Asia. You know, there really are very different things, and yet we're all kind of lumped together too often by the media in one generation. So it's really important to think very sensibly about about this. And of course, what's very true, let's think more globally now, are all millennials going through the same experiences in the same way? 
Of course, we're influenced by the times that we grew up in, the big world events that shape our life, and the, the country and the economy in which we grew up. And to illustrate this point, I'm going to give you the example of two countries that begin with the letter P. Portugal and the Philippines. Now, I'm sure you remember from your geography lessons about the population pyramid uh, from human geography. Look at the, the section at the bottom there shows Gen X, uh, sorry, Gen Y and Gen Z. Uh, in Portugal, of course, it has a more a uh, aging population. The largest section of the population is around uh, uh, 40 years old, 40 years old and upwards, and of course, population of 10 million people. Look at the Philippines. It's 10 times the size of population. And look how youthful that population is. That is where the growth is going to come from in the future. But of course, the economy, economic situation in each country is very different. So it, again, it's very easy to talk about millennials in general, but where are they coming from and what are they living through? Again, so these are my conclusions about how millennials are different and how we have to treat them differently. Of course, their needs, uh, of course, can change rapidly as they grow. Um, and that's why it's absolutely essential to look at general cons consumer patterns, the way that people are interacting with brands more generally in consumer culture, before we worry about what's happening in the travel industry. Um, and then, of course, take some lessons from that about how we can shape good, decent products for people who are based upon their personal life experiences. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, we have to in think about, of course, how different millennials from around the world are acting. And um, we're actually, there's a big subject on the table at the moment at this WTM, which is about tourism dispersal and how you encourage millennials to travel further. Uh, we, as uh, Toposophy, is currently working with the Pacific Asia Travel Association on measuring exactly that. How can you influence all of those future travelers from China, India, Philippines? Uh, how can you influence them to explore the destination further? This is uh, both an economic possibilities and it's, a, it's an opportunity, I think, for the sector in the future. But if we get it wrong, then it's going to cause huge amounts of congestion and conflict in destinations. And this is the generation that's going to make the difference there. Um, of course, but so to be able to respond to this trend, we think that it's important, of course, to understand how millennials tick about the values of, of the young generation today. And that's why it's really important, of course, to look beyond those stereotypes, those media headlines that you see all the time. Um, and of course, by doing so, work with your own millennials. Ask them how they see the world, how they want to develop their products. Um, of, course, of course, we come back to this all the time, and it makes perfect sense, is that the answer really is in the palm of your hand. But when you're developing uh, tech products, when you're developing those tools to help people explore the destination, it has to be something practical. It has to actually answer a, a problem, not just create technology for technology's sake. So again, is this going to change the world? Well, I actually think for travel brands it is because you certainly can't afford to get this one wrong. This is absolutely essential to really understand. Uh, you know, you really can't, uh, you, because millennials, if you, pr if, you, uh, if you produce some piece of content that people th don't think is relevant, if you fail to personalize sufficiently, well, of course, you know, this is the generation that's used to swiping left. Next, you know, people don't have half an hour of their day to take up watching your videos. They barely have 30 seconds to sit and watch your videos. So, you know, think very carefully about that when you're producing uh, content for millennials. This is also a generation that has grown up in the era of globalization, has grown up with uh, huge changes in culture, and I know that's definitely the case in Britain. And I've seen a lot of research that talks about how if you respect the, the diversity um, and, uh, and among millennials and among the generation that they've grown up in, then you'll get good results uh, at the bottom line. So yeah, and of course, personalization in customer service is essential as well. Um, for a more complete guide as what we've done, we've actually produced a free guide, 16 pages, for uh, DMOs and travel brands. You can download it today from our website. Uh, it's all perfectly free. Just fill in a small form and, and we'll send you the report immediately. Um, and of course, I have, my, uh, have several colleagues with me here, Manolis, Roxanne, and Samina, and we'll be very happy to talk to you about that later on after the session. Um, but I want to thank you very much for listening to that and hope you vote for me because I need coffee. <laughs> thank you. Just while we have a quick break, guys, um, 
just one thing I, I was meant to say to you at the start is that um, at the end of this session, if you um, would like to give myself or um, my colleague Donovan, who will be at the back door and is waving his hand down there, um, your business cards, or you can write down your contact details. We can uh, pass them on to the speakers. We can introduce you, or we can uh, send you the presentations that they've done or the slides that we can share. So all of this will be available afterwards, um, and you can catch up. So do make sure to drop your business cards to me or hand them off uh, when you exit the room at the end of the session. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, and uh, thanks, Peter, for uh, the two trends. Um, so my name's Ian Cumming. I'm the founder of a community called uh, Travel Massive. And uh, just before I start out, this is actually my first WTM. So I thank Michael for uh, asking me to, to come here and speak to you guys today. But I want to just understand um, where you guys come from. So just hands up if you're like a travel blogger or a content creator. Okay, a few people. If you're a digital marketer, um, destinations, um, if you're a travel brand or travel company. Okay, all right. Um, so, Travel Massive, uh, just to my background, I grew up in Tasmania. Uh, I live between Sydney and, uh, and Bangkok uh, at the moment. And um, I'm the creator of uh, an organization called Travel Massive, which some of you uh, know. But if you haven't heard of Travel Massive, we're a worldwide um, community of people who work in the travel industry. And our mission is to unearth and connect the world's uh, travel industry in order to make a purposeful change to the way that we travel. So we connect content creators, um, travel uh, innovators and startups, uh, travel brands, destinations and companies um, all around the world at uh, different chapters. So we have uh, chapters in more than 110 cities and 50 countries. So my job uh, in Travel Massive uh, is part of growing the organisation, but what I really get to do um, is uh, one thing which I love is to travel around the world and I get to meet people and destinations and startup companies um, and really sort of get a feel for you know what's happening in a global sense sort of in the world um, uh, you know world tourism and world travel so you know the last four weeks I've been in Russia Singapore Bangkok Manila and now here in London speaking with business owners uh, people who work in travel, and I always ask them, you know, what do they think are the next trends? So I'm really happy that Michael invited me to, to, to come here and talk to you about trends. So I'll get stuck into it. Now, if you're a blogger, I'm really sorry that I'm going to offend you with this, uh, with this trend. Um, but basically, I believe that video is going to be the king of content. So this is my trend number one. So the reason for this, I think, now, um, I'm just going to put this statistic up here, which is that I think that the cost to create a high quality uh, video is about a hundred times cheaper than a decade ago. Now, this source is from my gut and, you know, the gut has more nerves than the brain, therefore, you know, my gut tells me, you know, over my brain, I believe my gut. But, you know, if you really look at it, 10 years ago, how much did uh, an expensive camera cost? Um, you know, a computer to be able to edit video and all the equipment that you needed was probably, you know, at least twenty, thirty thousand dollars And, you know, these days, even on my phone, I can shoot in 4K video, right? And if you really want to um, be able to create, uh, you know, movie quality video, all you need is a, is a DSLR, you know, a MacBook Pro and a copy of Final Cut. So you can get all of that for at least under a couple of thousand um, pounds. You know, compare that to a decade ago. So, you know, video is exploding. You know, we have super fast uh, 4G networks that allow us to watch video on sort of any device. Uh, we've got bigger screens. I mean, this is my phone here. It doesn't even hardly fit in my pocket. I can watch a movie on it. And we've got more distribution channels for video than you can think of. You know, there's YouTube. Uh, you can post videos on Twitter, any social media um, platform. There's Vimeo. Um, and there's also things like Snapchat. So why do I believe that video is going to conter, uh, conquer, you know, written content um, in terms of travel? Well, I think 
One reason is that video has a higher conversion rate. So, you know, a lot of studies have shown um, from marketers that, uh, you know, when people watch a product video, um, the, the conversion rate of that person buying that particular product um, is increased over written content. And you can Google this and, and uh, find a number of different studies that, that support this. So for brands, travel brands that want to sell stuff, obviously making a video of it is going to um, increase the conversion rate. I think the other thing is the good video is rewatchable. And uh, I don't know how many times I've, I've like, you know, remember the funny cat video on YouTube that I want to show my friends or something like that, but I'll watch a video again. And again, if you compare that to written content, you know, I really don't think the number of times I go back and reread a blog post or something that someone has written, whereas video will watch time and time again because it's enjoyable. The other thing is that video is social and by that I mean that you can watch video with other people together so you know on the bus ride home last night after Travel Massive we were watching uh, videos together um, in our team and uh, again it's not like I'm going to say hey Michael come over here and like let's read this blog post together you know I mean are you up uh, are you are you at the same point that I'm at so you know video is, is is social and the other thing is is that video is measurable and I believe it's more measurable than written content because you know where the person is is watching and you know YouTube and Vimeo have really um, incredible statistics uh, to to allow people to understand how far people watch a video whether they skip through a video and again I think that video um, is more measurable which means that if you're a marketer you know you really get some amazing insights into video but I think you know one of the big challenges of video and I guess it could also be an opportunity is that most destinations and brands, you know, they don't really know how to create good video. They really struggle with that because, you know, as the cost of video production has come down, you know, if you want to go out to a production company and, you know, make a 20-second TV ad, they're still going to charge you $100,000. And I guess what's happening now is that um, brands and destinations are starting to find, you know, talent with people who have, uh, you know, can create video for a much cheaper price uh, point, um, but there's still, you know, there's still a lot of infrastructure. There's still a lot of skills that need to be developed in this area to be able to fulfil the demand um, of destinations. So that's also an opportunity for content creators. So I want to give you guys also a prediction, uh, as well as this trend, you know, that I believe that Snapchat will become the new influencer platform for travel. And just a show of hands, who here is on Snapchat? Wow, I mean, just like if you're at the front, have a look around. It, I mean, there's a lot of people on, on Snapchat. So, you know, Snapchat was uh, invented by two Stanford students, uh, Evan Spiegel and Bobby Murphy. They have 100 million monthly active users, but uh, what is interesting is they've turned down, you know, billion dollar acquisition uh, offers by, you know, Google and Facebook. The company is now valued by Forbes at $19 billion. Um, and uh, back to Peter, not that I want Peter to win, you know, but uh, to support his thing about millennials, you know, the, the user base of, of Snapchat is 13 to 24 year olds. So 70%, 77% of Snapchat's users are college students, right? But just think about that because 10 years ago, 77% or probably even more of Facebook's users were college students, right? So, you know, Snapchat has uh, an enormous potential. So there's something like 400 million snaps uh, every day are sent through the Snapchat network. And I'm going to add one to that by Snapchatting me here on stage. Hey guys, I'm at WTM and I want everyone to say hi. hi. So that's easy. I'm going to send that. I'm going to send that to my story, and I think all of five people who are following me are going to read that. But um, you can actually follow Travel Massive on Snapchat, and, and uh, I think we've got more followers. So, you know, that's my prediction. I really think that Snapchat is going to become a huge influencer platform um, for travel, and Snapchat is, uh, is video-based, you know. It's engaging, and, you know, it's incredibly addictive as well. So that's my first trend. Uh, and just before I move to my second, um, 
If you have a look at uh, Travel Massive, this is just, um, you might want to take a photo of this or you see my slides later. We have a growing uh, community, uh, a user base within the Travel Massive community of video content creators from all around the world. So my next trend um, is going to be a little bit closer to home to where I live in Bangkok where I think that Asia is going to become the biggest travel market in the world. And rather than that actually being a trend, that's going to become a fact, okay? So before I begin, I want to thank a friend of mine, Kay Shibata from uh, Trip101 uh, and Travel.jp. He lives in Tokyo uh, and he provided some of this data for me to be able to, to show. So thanks to Kay. So why is Asia going to become you know, number one. I mean, you just have to look at the, the stats, right? So here's a chart of direct contribution um, to GDP from uh, in, in travel and tourism. So you can see North America, Europe and Asia, they're pretty close. And this is uh, for this year, 2015. But if you look at the trends, and this is from uh, the World Tourism Council, you can see here that Asia is going to exceed, you know, one trillion dollars towards GDP, and it's going to eclipse Europe and North America. So, you know, it's a huge market. I think the other reason is, and the opportunity is that Asia leads in mobile. And why is that? Um, so again, we'll go with some stats. Not my gut this time, but. Um, if we have a look at these bar charts, down the bottom we have different countries, Japan, Korea, US, UK, Thailand and so on. And this shows you travel search queries by country based off of where it's coming from. So the bottom blue chart, um, blue bit is um, PC desktop, then in the middle is smartphone and then up the top there is tablet. And if we have a look at Asian countries, you can see that it's the biggest smartphone penetration compared to, you know, non-Asian countries. So Asia really leads by mobile. And, it, you know, if uh, you don't believe me, we just have a look at mobile internet subscribers. So these are the subscribers all around the world and the uh, penetration of 4G and 3G networks. And if I highlight the Asian countries um, in this data, you know, look at Japan, 20% 4G penetration. Look at South Korea, almost 50%. You know, it's more than double that of the United States. So Asia really leads in mobile, which means that if you're into content marketing and uh, or anything in travel, you really have to target, um, if you want to target the Asian traveler, you really have to be out there on mobile. And most importantly, the thing that I want to get across to you guys with this trend is that you can't just say, uh, you know, Asia is just one sort of region. Asia, Asia is diverse. You know, every country is different, uh, not only in terms of culture and things like that, but technology. So I'm going to play a game with you guys, which is called Spot uh, the Travel Company that you recognize. So what I've done here is, um, or what my friend uh, Kay from Trip101 put together, is uh, a list of brands uh, that, that for different countries in, in Asia that people use. So up the top we have OTA, which are you know, online travel agencies, uh, MetaSearch, through to GDS, user-generated content, uh, and then we have search, uh, social networks and stuff. You know, and when you think of uh, you know, Australia or you know, UK um, you know, or, or America, you, know, you think of these brands like Priceline, Booking.com, you know, Skyscanner, cheap flights, and that. But when you, and you know, when you look at social networks, we all think about Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. And when we think about, you know, messaging platforms, we always think about, you know, uh, um, you know, WhatsApp. And for search, we think about Google. But in Asia, it's totally different. So you know, here's China, uh, where you know the biggest video platform is called Youku. You know, they're not even on uh, or using YouTube. And uh, then if we have a look at Japan, again, you'll see some familiar sites in there, like, you know, Facebook and uh, Twitter is quite strong uh, in, uh, in social networking. But in search, you know, Yahoo is almost on par with Google in terms of search. If we look at India, there's a lot of sort of familiar brands that we might know of. 
um, especially in the OTA space. And uh, if we look at Korea, um, you know, have a look at the search, right? They're not using Google or anything like that that we'd know of. You know, Naver and uh, Doim are the two major search engines. I just want to go back just super quick to Japan. I want to tell you guys something. You know, one of the biggest opportunities in Asia is in uh, chat and um, using chat as a distribution method for brands. So you'll see in Japan there's a thing uh, called Line. And is anyone on Line? A few people. So, you know, Line uh, is a really interesting story that I'll just spend 30 seconds telling you about. In the 2011 uh, earthquake in Japan, an 8.9 magnitude uh, level earthquake, which pretty much killed uh, tens of thousands of people and took out all of the com communication systems. Uh, a team from a local telecommunication company called Naver built uh, a messaging platform called Line. And within 18 months, it had, had acquired uh, more than 100 million users. Uh, I think the stat now is about 200 million and Line is used all over Asia along with uh, things like WeChat and um, and, uh, and Viva, but the, again, the thing, if you're a content marketer and you're looking at marketing into, uh, into Asia is to look at Line because online you have a Line store. If you're a brand, you can engage with, uh, you know, people can direct message you. So a lot of travel companies are building uh, their distribution on these social platforms um, such as Line, you know, which is what we've never heard of. So that gives you a little bit of an idea about the diversity of Asia. Um, and uh, I'll wrap it up there, but basically, you know, my two trends, definitely video and, um, and Asia, I think, are the next big trends in travel. So thanks very much. So just while we get the next uh, session set up, just remember to, we are, we're going to be doing a bit of a vote on... Um, on this at the end. Um, and just before that, we're going to do a very quick Q&A. If any of you uh, would like to um, send in a question over Twitter, if you don't like talking in front of a few hundred people, um, just use the uh, Twitter handle at uh, Traverse Events, T-R-A-V-E-R-S-E-E-V-E-N-T-S. -E -E um, and I'll pick that up and I'll, uh, I'll ask that at the end. But we will probably just have a few minutes for, quest minutes for questions. So you might be best to come and ask them individually afterwards anyway. Now it's my turn, there's a lot of you. Um, hi, I'm Sarah Betty, um, hello. I am a blogger, a lifestyle blogger. I blog at sarahbetty.co.uk. And as part of that, I was also doing a lot of business and travel blogging. And the business blogging under that came under Business Betty, so it was like what it was like to run um, a business from somebody that doesn't have a clue, pretty honest about that. Um, I, I don't try to be professional in any manner, you'll probably see this through this sort of typeface. Um, so what I wanted to talk to you about was based on my experience and my personal trends that excite me in both the, the travel world and the marketing world. I'm also a digital consultant, so I'm um, head of social and strategist at Havas at the moment. And we work with all names of brands to um, really implement their digital strategies across platforms. But my very first job was working for Debbie Hindle at BGB, and that's how I got into travel and how I got to know him, woo, how I got to know lots of the travel bloggers as well. How are you? I was told that was polite. My mom would be proud. This is Business Betty. That's an illustration that's supposed to look like me, but she's way prettier. Um, Business Betty is a global network of female entrepreneurs. I like to say kick-ass female entrepreneurs. Um, what a lot of us have in common is ambition. We had ambition from the beginning and we were looking for like-minded people to connect with. So what has this got to do with anything that I'm going to talk about? Well, you'll see. This is me. Right? Cute. What do you see in this picture? I see ambition. You see the ambition there? Look, the dog knows it. The dog knows I have ambition. And what, again, that has to do with is when I was little, and I am getting onto my trend, when I was little, all I wanted to be, apart from a microbiologist, because that sounded really clever, was an astronaut. 
And yeah, this is literally all I wanted to do. I um, took this right up to A level. I tried to do um, A level physics and maths, failed both. Wasn't clever enough. I was never going to be an astronaut. See, just to rub it in. So what's the answer to this? And other people that, like, as a kid in the 80s, you're growing up, you're dreaming about space. Like, what is the answer to all of this? If you can't afford to learn to be a pilot, to go into any of this, or you just generally have a geeky fascination with space, the answer was, and this should have its own theme tune. Da, 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 da. It's the wrong theme tune. I don't know what that is. Space is not the new frontier. Like, we all know that space tourism is happening. We all know that SpaceX are getting involved. Like, you've got Virgin, obviously, involved. That's not the trend that I want to talk about. Basically, I think what I want to talk about is, yeah, nice little picture there, is how we get there. And that's what's really exciting to me as somebody that isn't necessarily like a huge expert in the travel industry, but coming more from the consumer point of view. How we get to space now is the new frontier. I don't know if any of you guys have seen this before. Is, is anyone aware of the whole idea of going up to space in a balloon? Anyone? Hands up? Awesome. I was really scared that more people would know about this. Um, up to the moon in a balloon. I wrote a little bit of poetry there for you. So basically, um, rockets and spaceships, etc., cetera, um, Virgin Galactic is all a very expensive way of getting into space. It's not necessarily attainable for somebody like me. It could cost up to $250,000. Um, the option that I'm talking about here is by Worldview Enterprises. And essentially, they've got these high altitude balloons, and you can go up to space, they're saying, in 2017 for just $75,000. So you'll just be on the stratosphere. And how is this affecting the travel industry? Well, I think that more people will want to save money to do something amazing like this than you think. And I've got even cheaper options for you. So basically, these are made from like a durable material, and the, f the pumped full of, where have you gone? The pumped full of helium, and you can, it takes about 30, no, about two hours to get up there. And you can see in the little bit there, I think it takes up to about five people at any one time. And the advantages that it has is that it's much cheaper, um, and also I think you can stay suspended in the air longer than you would have on Virgin Galactic. Now, even cheaper, $30,000. A company called Bristol Space Planes, they're crowdfunding their way into the business. So crowdfunding's actually helping change the way that tourism is happening. Everyone knows again about crowdfunding. You know, you put a pitch out on one of these websites like Crowdcube, etc. People, if they uh, believe in you, will buy into it. Just jumping ahead a little bit there. Um, so essentially, that they're saying that in it'll be $2,700 by 2030 to go to space, which I think is pretty amazing. Um, what they're doing first is they are going into the satellite business so that they'll uh, reinvent these planes so that they can take humans, and that's how they're going to charge the consumer less in the long run. It's also going to mean that people might be able to hop a flight from Paris to Sydney in two hours, which changes the game of business travel. It changes the game for people like myself that are emigrating and want to go home for a family emergency in two hours. It changes the way that even the blogging side of the travel industry works. If you wanted some UK bloggers to come over to Asia or even to Sydney, this is going to be game-changing for the way that we operate on a global scale. This is me again with a camera. I'm going into my second trend of talking about what is going to be affecting the digital side of um, the travel industry. I did my first Periscope ever the other night with Kate. Where are you, Kate? Put your hand up. There we go. We were at the Lonely Planet event, and I was like, I'm just going to try Periscope, see what happens. I did it, and I got 30 views. Woo! Uh, but the whole point of that is that I got to take my followers with me live. And like loads of people are probably on Periscope, right? Put your hands up if you're on Periscope. Yeah, there's a good amount of people. This isn't a new trend. But what I'm going to talk about is the way that it's going to influence the market going forward. We've touched on video already, but this is just my opinion on it. You can't see my Periscope now. It's gone. 
So basically, everything is going to be live all the time. And one of the first places that I noticed it, this trend was in Korea. Now, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but there's like loads of people online, influencers, and they are eating their food in front of cameras. Has anyone seen this? And uh, essentially, in Korea, they, um, it's not part of the culture to dine alone. That's not a, a natural thing. So people like to watch other people eating. It's a kind of voyeurism, but also like this guy earns loads of money from doing this. So essentially, the, the, on your right, you can see the live chat. So I was like, this, this is going to happen in the UK soon. We are going to have a live video stream where people can chat to you and then Periscope happens, right? So I think it's going to go even further. So if these people like his video, they, um, they pay him with like little balloons. So I think that's a super interesting way you just eat your food. And he's doing this at midnight in his office. He works hard. This is another girl, and she just quit her job at 34 to do this, so she can earn about, well, what have I written here? About 5,000 pounds a month just from advertising and donations, they call it. So that's enough for her to just live on, just by eating food in front of a camera. It's, it's crazy, but, uh, you know, like places like Korea, they're influencing what we in the UK and Europe will be doing, so it's really good to keep your eye on that, like, you know, we were talking about Asia, like what Asia's doing. And also what bloggers in Asia are doing from a business point of view for bloggers, like what can we be thinking about next? So I'm wondering, on Periscope, is this the way it's going to go? Are bloggers going to eventually get paid? Are the little hearts going to become little payments? So if I'm taking you to Paris with me and you think I'm doing an awesome job, if you're paying me, does that mean you're paying for my dinner that night? It's a really interesting way to think about how it's going, so it's really good to like, look again what these sort of places are doing. And we're catching up. Here, um, you've got a certain blogger who was taking people around her house. They wanted to see the fridge, yeah. They wanted to see the eggs. She showed the fridge, They've got loads of hearts. This is the kind of thing we're doing. Um, and then, this was a campaign from Skyscanner that I believe was put together in five days. There's some, probably some bloggers in the room that were part of this. Um, and it was 24-hour Periscope where they took, oh, I've got the stats here, they had 23,715 viewers. I think there was between five and 10 bloggers involved in this, and it was broadcast at the same time, and it reached 1.6 million users. Um, so, and, it, and the hashtag trended on Twitter. So if you really start to think about how you can use Periscope from a marketing point of view to bring together people from around the world, like you're bringing like your global audience and um, you're reaching them in a local way and that's what Periscope really allows you to do. Um, the rise of the microblogger. So more and more people like myself, if you've got a blogger, sometimes if you have to bang out a load of content on a blog, you've got to take the pictures, you've got to edit the pictures. It takes, like, you know, sometimes a good six hours to get a good blog on there. Periscope, I, you know, I take a mini video and then bam, it's done. That's my post for the day. And more and more people are going to be doing this. There's more people that prefer to use Instagram sometimes than the blog, and they're becoming just micro bloggers through that actual um, platform, and that's what, again, what we're going to see more and more of here, and even just members of the public that are becoming vloggers in their own right without having to have necessarily a domain to do that. Um, and I think if we're thinking as companies here, what we need to realize is that we could almost have ambassadors within our company that, you know, they could be like your Periscope reporters or your Scope reporters, send them on little missions around the world. If they don't necessarily have the time, say, at WTM to be writing up blogs all the time, they'd be doing little scopes for you along the way. And I was told to keep it short and sweet, so you can find me at Sarah Betty Style. Those were my two personal trends. They might not change the travel world, but they're certainly changing mine. Thank you. Hi, well, thank you very much to the three um, fantastic speakers, Ian, Sarah, Betty, and Peter. 
Um, we've got 10 minutes left, so uh, we're going to do five minutes of very quick questions, and then we're going to have a, a quick vote and see who wins with the uh, top trend to look out for for the next few years. So, um, uh, who has questions? We do have one. We're just bringing a mic over to you. Won't be a moment. Yep, with a hand up. Hi, hi. I'm um, Jay from Exodus Travels. We do um, activity and adventure, really exciting travel. Um, and our average age is 51. I, I just want to take you up a little bit, Peter, sorry, to devil's advocate on the millennials thing. Isn't the trend um, around technology change or, or around population explosion and therefore there being more young people rather than just young people? I mean, my, if you look on YouTube, you could find a video of my mum who's nearly 70 hula hooping a beer festival which she took on a smartphone put online on her blog which was about her kilimanjaro attempt this summer you know isn't it isn't it about pe people are changing attitudes are changing yeah there are more young people and so they more of them might be doing it particularly in asia and things they might be using these this technology but isn't saying there are Lots of young people, kind of a cop out as a trend. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also have a story about mine, but I, I, in fact, I'm sure all of us can share stories about our, like our parents who, you know, grappling with technology. My parents uh, travel. I, I talked to my parents on Skype with their iPad, and they said, "Oh, we're millennial travellers as well." Um, and yeah, I mean, it's okay. It's a good point. I, I take that point. I think I would just go back to my the sort of central argument of that trend presentation is I'm trying to help people to understand that it's about becoming future ready and it's about um, sort of preparing, you know, ch changing some of the way you're doing the marketing and management in terms of adapting technology. And it happens to be the millennial generation that I do think is is driving up a lot of this technology use. It is the generation that is driving the growth of the sharing economy, use of the Airbnb. But of course, it's not the only generation that's doing those things. Abs I absolutely, uh, absolutely get that. But I do think that it is millennials who are often influencing the way that their parents uh, will uh, adapt to technology and that kind of thing. So yeah, it's, it's often, it's not about the age, it's more about the state of mind. And it is really interesting to see this transformation taking place in the travel industry. Um, but I would argue that those changes are now being driven by the millennial generation. Thanks. And that's one vote you're not getting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we've got time for, for one more uh, quick question, if someone says. Right at the back, you're really making us walk. Uh, the lady in the middle of the aisles at the back. If you could try and keep the question quite short, that would be wonderful. Same with the answers. Oh, hi. Um, this is for Sarah Bethy. I'm quite interested in the Periscope. I've never actually heard of it. Um, are people getting rich off it? Is that the norm? Is it normal that a lot of people can quit their jobs? Or is it like YouTube where something goes viral and that's kind of one in a million? So, oh, is this on? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, there we go. Hello. Um, so when I was referencing people being able to quit the job, that was in Korea on a different platform. I should have been clearer. On Periscope, I'm unaware of people making money yet. It probably is the case. Um, yeah, sorry. I'll... Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, I feel like it's going to be the way it goes if it follows the same platform that the um, bloggers are using in Korea. As of now, I, I don't know any stats to back up if people have been able to quit their job using Periscope. Just a small comment I wanted to make. Um, a couple of observations I've made about as I've been listening to this, actually. First of all, obviously, in the future, we're all going to need to go around equipped with a really good webcam. Um, but also, that um, I, there's a lesson that I've taken from this in some of the research I do, and that is about the power that millennials are using. This is a generation which has grown up very used to uh, carving out its own personal brand. So whether that's, you know, to the extent that Sarah has so fantastically, or even just you know constantly communicating about where you're going, the things you're buying, the places you're going on holiday. This is a generation that really is understanding the impact of what they share online. I think more so than parents' generation who kind of like upload a picture of the dog and then tag everybody, you know, open to everybody publicly all around <laughs> all around the world, and then pub t you know uh, tag you and your neighbours in there and everything else. No, this is a generation which I think has grown up very aware of how how they look online. 
And that's something which travel brands really need to capitalize on. They really need to understand that people, the decisions that people make when they travel and they consume things really do say a lot about them uh, themselves as a brand. I think that's another important trend to sort of grab, uh, grab hold of. Yep, uh, I agree entirely with that. <coughs> I think just uh, just a quick side note before we go to voting. It's uh, it's quite amazing sometimes when you meet some of these people who have this uh, this online persona, and then you meet them in real life, and they're they're completely different. Maybe they're really shy personally, and then online they're this really outgoing person. It is, is I mean they they cultivate a brand for their person, and I think people are doing it at a younger younger age as well. Some of the YouTube stars are about twelve, or so it's worrying. Anyway, so um, there's time to have a, a, a quick vote um, before we all head off for our afternoon appointments. So I'm just going to go through the three, and let's have a show of hands if you think that's going to be the number one, um, and we'll try and judge which one is the best. If not, I'm drinking it. So, sorry. This is on? Yeah. Just want to say that if you vote for me, um, <laughs> I'll give you a Travel Massive sticker, and we have some T-shirts to give out as well. All right. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> That's not fair. I That's don't have any t-shirts or stickers. You should be excluded. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Didn't expect that. Um, <laughs> okay, so we're just going to go through them in order. Um, so number one is about millennial proofing. That's, um, that's the most in, important thing that you've got to do. So who's voting for trend number one, which is uh, make sure you millennial proof yourself. Is that a good way of describing it? Yeah, millennial proof your brand. Millennial proof your brand. Okay. 27. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, at least my boss is voting for me. He's down <laughs> in the front. <laughs> uh, trend number two um, is about sticking with millennials, which I've heard that word enough time for the rest of my life today, um, is uh, not all millennials are the same, so adapting to, to realise that the ones with tattooed people on the West Coast. 14. Okay. Uh, number three, video is going to be the king of content. Oh, a lot of people want stickers. <laughs> okay. That's 53. Uh, number four. Asia will be uh, become the number one you know, powerhouse destination area. I'm voting for that one as well. I agree. That's a good way to lose. I agree. Yeah. yeah. You can't, you can't okay. deny it. Yeah. 38. Um, Sarah's... Um, I, I don't know whether to say that this is space is not the new frontier or space is, because it seems to go both ways, so I'm just going to say space travel which actually I want to vote for myself because I really want to go. So, three. And um, lastly, uh, number six, and uh, I think this is actually, uh, maybe I should vote for this one as well, uh, which is the, I've just called it Beyond Periscope, basically this, this whole online brand uh, that we're seeing. It's funny, if this was WTM Asia, I think that would have won. Okay, so the, the winner... Um, is uh, number three, which was presented by Ian from Travel Massive, which is Asia to become, uh, sorry, no it's not, it's video is going to be the king of content. <laughs> Ian, would you like to come and collect your prize? And I did get prizes for both of you two as well, would you like to come up?